Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the third in the series of four webinars covering the BSP development of the S3 guidelines uh, that have been published recently and are available on the BSP website. I'm Ian Dunn, and I'm going to be your host again for this evening. Before I introduce our speaker, we always go through the housekeeping. I know those of you who are stalwarts of these webinars will, will be sick of this bit now, but we often have new listeners, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Our speaker tonight is going to talk for about 45 to 50 minutes, and at any point during the webinar, you can type box. Uh, I will collate questions at the end, and we'll be asking them, putting them to the speaker following the presentation. Due to the really large number of attendees tonight, we have to keep the questions relevant to step three of the S3 guidelines, and we won't be deviating off topic. Um, and if, if needs be, if there's any burning questions that you need to ask on, on Perio, they can be emailed into the society. Following the webinar, you will be sent a link uh, to record your feedback on the webinar and also to collect your CPD certificates. But this link will only be sent out a couple of days after the webinar, so just keep an eye out in your email inbox. On to tonight's main event. Our speaker yet again needs no formal introduction. The BSP have brought out all the big hitters for the, uh, for the presentations. What I will say about our speaker, I'm not going to go through his CV, but our speaker uh, and, and myself are both Liverpool football supporters. Not that we brag about that at the moment. Um, and the last time we did a webinar together, I don't know whether you remember, Nikos, Liverpool were yes. playing in the European Cup on the way to winning the Champions League that year. Uh, we vowed never to book another webinar again on a Champions League night. And here we are missing the second leg uh, of, of a Liverpool game in, in the Champions League. So we're going to keep the questions short at the end because Nikos and I have got a football game to catch up on. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to our speaker for this evening, uh, Professor Nikos Donos and step three of the S3 guidelines. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you very much, Ian. And I'm in full agreement uh, that uh, we shouldn't have booked that on a, a, a Liverpool uh, game day, especially when this is our only hope for potentially doing a little bit better than uh, the recent results uh, have indicated in, in uh, the we Premiership. We really must check our diaries, Nick, because we really must. I know. I and mean, we need to coordinate that. Or Liverpool has to coordinate according to the BSP webinars. Maybe that's... <laughs> yeah, I, we think. So I think I mean, it, it just shows how, how, how dedicated we are to Perry and Nick. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, I'm going to myself and over to you. Yes. Ever... So, uh, uh, welcome everybody. It is really uh, always a great pleasure to be uh, part of this BSP web web webinars, and of course to be hosted by uh, my good friend Ian, um, where we you can see we can share a great interest on, on football and especially with Liverpool Football Club. But today we will be discussing something more in a, in a professional level, and we will be discussing the surgical periodontal therapy, more specifically the step three of uh, the surgical periodontal uh, therapy, as has been uh, implemented now uh, from the BSP by taking over the EFP guidelines, uh, which were uh, published um, almost a year ago. I am pretty sure you have heard that before uh, from our previous speakers for the step one and the step two, where uh, you have seen uh, how the guidelines have been developed and uh, what these steps means in terms of your everyday clinical practice. Just a kind of reminder that uh, a number of people uh, have been gathered uh, in, in Segovia where we have produced uh, the treatment of stage one to three for periodontitis and we use the S3 levels, which is basically a combination of evidence-based but also consensus-based guidelines, which is of course the highest level of uh, guideline development that we could have had. Further on, uh, the BSP, uh, with great work uh, that uh, was uh, um, was chaired by our uh, secretary, uh, Nicola West, uh, as well as from Moritz Kepschul, uh, we have um, uh, created through a series of meetings the implementation of the European S3 guidelines in order to be able to uh, Adopt it to an, an adopt it and adopt it to a UK clinical practice. And today uh, we will be focusing more on the surgical component. Uh, you have discussed the state step uh, uh, one and two, and that means that you're already familiar with how the evidence-based recommendation will be uh, is produced in the publications, but also will be discussed and presented today. Um, just a, a very uh, a kind of a refresher, uh, they will be coming up as uh, boxes, as blocks where the uh, question 
question and a statement will be appearing of what is the guideline and of course the level which is the supporting literature which will always be a high quality systematic review but sometimes it will be a statement for for the step three or expert opinion uh, the quality of evidence will be presented but it will not be discussed in, in, in details in terms of how many rcts and how many patients the grade of recommendation will always be present and be emphasized and the strength of the consensus will be uh, shown but not discussed in great details just to remind you when you see a grade a that means that it's a strong recommendation and it will be portrayed in the box uh, as we recommend or we do not recommend and there will be two arrows up or two arrows down for when we do not recommend as something specific uh, when we have uh, the grade B, then we have a recommendation, not as strong though as the A, and we will be using the word suggest to with an arrow up or suggest not to with an arrow down. And of course, we have the O, which is a, basically an open recommendation, which a treatment will be or may be considered, uh, but there's not enough evidence to say that one way is much better than, than the other. In terms of strength of consensus, so uh, what you will be seeing written, we have the unanimous, which is basically all the participants were happy to support the consensus statement. But then we have uh, four other groups, the strong uh, consensus, when it's a 75 to 95 percent of participants, and then, of course, no consensus, which uh, was less than 50 percent of participants, which is not the case in these guidelines. Moving on, you have discussed the step one, you have discussed the step two, just the physical therapy, and uh, I would like, oh, sorry. And uh, the, we introduced, of course, the uh, PM, uh, PR uh, term, which is the professional mechanical plaque removal with or without adjunctive therapies. And now we have completed our treatment and we move to the periodontal uh, reevaluation. And after that, we need to move to the next step in order to uh, treat further the patients and resolve the periodontal defects. And this is the step three, where the endpoints would be that there we should not have any bleeding or probing or presence of deep pockets equal or more than six millimeters, or generally no pockets equally or more than four millimeters. And when and if we achieve that with the step three, we can move to the step four that Professor Nicola Wells will be discussing with you in a few days, which is the supported periodontal care. An important point for the step three is that, and it's also clearly indicated both uh, at uh, the EFP uh, uh, consensus statements, but also the BSP implementation, is that we may not always be able to achieve these endpoints uh, with a step three. And that does not necessarily mean that our treatment has failed. There are different, uh, different reasons that can, validate, can be valid and uh, can indicate one way or the other, why we may have not succeeded our uh, uh, endpoints that we discussed here. Another important point before we discuss uh, uh, um, the step three component is how these guidelines uh, have to be implemented in the UK. And I think here it's an important point that the paper that the BSP uh, has uh, uh, recently published is discussing. We need to work and we need to adopt and implement these guidelines to the current UK healthcare philosophy. And, and we're very privileged in the UK with the extremely hard work of the BSP and some leading uh, periodontists in the UK where, uh, to, who work with the uh, Office of the Chief Dental Officer, where the commissioning stands for restorative dentistry, where periodontology is included, we published in 2019. And this is, of course, supported with a good practitioner's guide that the BSP has uh, already been published and is re currently revising to uh, include uh, the new S3 guidelines. Now, the UK philosophy in terms of periodontology indicates that surgery, surgery, periodontal surgery, is not normally and immediately undertaken following a single phase of non-supported periodontal therapy. The non-surgical therapy outcome will be reviewed and in non-responder sites we will be repeating we aim to repeat the non-surgical periodontal therapy in engaging patients patients that they can demonstrate that they can control the risk factors and the oral hygiene in non-engaging patients surgery is definitely contraindicated this is something that we will be discussing uh, later on as well and of course our efforts will be on attempting on changing the behavior of the patients and having good oral hygiene now, once we have sites of five to six millimeters of pocket depth that do not bleed upon probing at sequential recall appointments, that means that these sites may be stable. And if there is no ongoing attachment loss, we 
are recommending to monitor the sites instead of immediately proceeding with surgery. They may develop to become surgical sites, but also may remain as non-surgical sites. So it is an important point to consider. Finally, within the primary care, when there is a doubt, please do refer. We should always, if we're in doubt and we're not sure about our own skills or that we have brought the patient up to a certain level and we cannot move on further, and there's a clear need for advanced periodontal care, then the clear referral to level two or three is recommended. I think this is something that, of course, it applies uh, for, for generally for periodontology, but specifically for step three has a great uh, an element, a great importance. And of course, it doesn't deviate from the international standards, but is well formulated with the uh, commissioning standards for restorative dentistry. So we move now to the guidelines. And I think an, an important point here, which is of course for all the periodontists and the, the, the dentists that uh, work with, uh, for, with uh, within periodontology as well as the dental teams, there's a clear rationale. When we do surgery, we do it in order to access and of course treat the non-responding sites of the step two. And the aim once we access these sites is to regenerate or eliminate the lesions that add complexity to the management of the periodontitis on these sites. And of course, extra uh, complex complexity comes with the type of the lesions, and in our case, the interbone and the frication lesions. Now, the interventions that we will be discussing today and are within the guidelines is the uh, different flap procedures, the access flap periodontal surgery, the resective periodontal surgery, and the regenerative periodontal surgery, but also, we will be looking at the value of the repeated subgingival instrumentation with or without adjunctive therapies in comparison to access to uh, different surgical procedures. And we start with our first clinical recommendation. And the question really is how effective are access flaps in comparison to repeated subgingival instrumentation? And I think here we need to remember that we just completed our periodontitis stage, uh, the patients are periodontitis stage three, we just completed step one and step two. And the, the, the guideline is that we suggest that for residual pockets of pockets more than equal or more than six millimeters, access flap surgery with a broader term should be employed for the further treatment of these patients. We always assume, of course, that the oral hygiene is uh, of the highest standard. However, for moderately deep residual pockets in the range of four to five millimeters, we do not proceed with surgery, but we prefer to repeat the subgingival instrumentation and try to control the, the, the periodontal condition in that way. So very clear guideline in the level of grade B and a clear suggestion from EFB and for how BHP implements that within the UK. So if we look at the comparison of how effective access flaps are compared to repeated sensible instrumentation, and it will go to the paper from Sanchez a little bit um, uh, more in depth, we can clearly see that the data support the fact that apical uh, access flaps, sorry, access flaps provide deeper, uh, better pocket reduction than subgingival deprivement, at least from uh, the first year onwards. Now this. A reduction of pockets is more pronounced on the deeper sides with pockets more or equal than six millimeters and in pockets that are associated with intra, intra bony defects. In terms of calcane clinical attachment level, there's basically uh, no significant difference observed at initially deep pockets. And if we look at moderately deep pockets, the calcane was greater in subgingival instrumentation, but Again, uh, the, and it is interesting to uh, remind that from the classic studies as well, that apical the access flaps resulted in more attachment loss at the sites where we have initial, the pocket depth was less than four millimeters. So I think that we know from a classic literature, nothing, uh, nothing new here, but it is important, the first bullet point, that when we have deep pockets, the access flaps are more effective than subgingival debridement. Now, in terms of PROMS patient reported outcomes, there were no significant differences between the interventions. An important point that it's discussed within the, uh, the EFE, but also on the BSP implementation in both consensus uh, documents is the component of retreatment, both for subgingival instrumentation and for access flaps. And I think it's something that we need to keep in mind that uh, very often, or not very often, but 
in some occasions, uh, we might not be able to achieve our end point that we discuss. And in that case, in the case of subjunctival instrumentation, this can be in the range of 8 to 29%. And in the cases of access flow, this range is between 0 and 14%. That does not mean that our treatment was a, a failed treatment. This is something that up to a certain extent we need we need and we can expect it with uh, uh, step three treatments. And it brings me to uh, a, a paper that uh, was uh, discussed by uh, Wilson and Cormer back in 96, and we have also discussed it in 2018 in Periodontology 2000, both were in Periodontology 2000 papers, where basically we kind of evaluate in a philosophical way the component of uh, periodontal retreatment. And really within the professional retreatment is seldom discussed because of course there is a reluctance to discuss uh, potential uh, endpoints which may be considered as failure for our colleagues. But I think this is now clarified and uh, uh, we can expect a significant uh, high level of uh, success with our step three treatments, but there are some sites that they might not respond to the endpoint, they might not result to the endpoints that we want them to be. And this is, can be easily seen by a study that uh, it was published in a very busy, uh, from data from a very busy practice in Norway already in 2005, where you could see that they have followed 100 patients for 13 years, and uh, they have seen that 40 patients, 40 out of 100 patients, or 12% of the teeth, they actually, in terms of surgery, they required surgical retreatment. And this surgical retreatment, which is, of course, much less in the systematic uh, review, it's 0 to 14%, was based because of the baseline. There was a poor prognosis of the teeth, uh, and there was potentially uh, the compliance of the patient was not very good. Again, based, we know that from the literature, and then they also associate that with the family history of periodontal disease. Now, Putting aside the small percentage of the size that they would not uh, necessarily uh, uh, respond, uh, and we are accepting that the vast majority of the cases will have a positive outcome if the oral hygiene is good, how effective are the different access flower procedures? And again, here, the BSP uh, uh, implementation of the recommendation from the EFP is actually in, uh, in Yes, we accept that residual pockets of more than six millimeters access flap surgery is uh, required, but there is insufficient evidence for a specific recommendation on the choice, on the choice of the flap procedure for patients with stage three perio. Access periodontal surgery can be carried out with different flap designs, and in the literature, the different flap designs that they were evaluated was the modified Whitman flap, the open flap, and the papilla preservation flap, which they, for example, uh, the, like the papilla preservation flaps are termed and considered conservative surgical procedures, which are those that they aim in root surfaces, access of the root surfaces without removing significant amounts of heart and soft tissues. And this is something that you can see there's a trend in the literature, the more and more cases and more and more papers are using these conservative surgical procedures when they do uh, trials in periodontal surgery. Now, if we look at the uh, question, what is the efficacy of pocket elimination reduction surgery in comparison with access flap surgery? If we look at the guideline, there was a very uh, nice paper uh, by the supporting evidence is coming from Pollock. And again, here we say, if we have a, a, a site which uh, uh, after step one and step two still has residual pockets of equal or more than six millimeters, then can we do resective surgery and is it as effective as the access flap surgery? And what we, uh, the evidence-based recommendation which is adopted by the BSP is that we suggest using resective periodontal surgery in this type of patients after the first two steps of therapy, but there's a clear potential for increase of gingival recession, as you can see in the picture which, where resective periodontal surgery has performed. This is pre-surgically and this is after surgery. And before we start doing, uh, saying that we do resective uh, surgery uh, uh, as, as a routine, and this is of course based on studies that they have been performed many uh, uh, many years ago in terms of the late 70s, late 70s, 80s, and some in the early uh, 90s with a, a, a very limited number of studies that they were done in the 2000s, 2012, I think the last one. 
And when you compare resective surgery and access flap, the new evidence that comes within systematic review, and this is an important point, is that resective surgery, you can do it, you will have more recession, and you will have more pocket reduction than doing an access flap at six months and around one year. But as the healing progresses and as the observation period progresses and assuming that these patients are under supported periodontal care, in terms of attachment level gains between resective surgery and access flap in a period of three to five years, there are no long-term differences. And if you look at the the data after the uh, um, uh, after the first, the second, the third year, and you go to the five years follow-up, actually between uh, resective surgery and access uh, uh, flap, there were no significant differences. So in a sense, in terms of pocket depth and attachment level. So in a sense, any differences that you will see with these type of procedures are evident in the first year. And this is important when you design your surgical procedures and you make a, a decision of the type of surgery that you will proceed, you progress. And of course, that will depend again on the case, on the site, and on what we want to achieve uh, in this specific patient. But this is new in terms that we have a kind of a normal, uh, we bring the, the, the healing is progressing in such way that access flaps and resective surgeries uh, in the long term have really no differences. Now, there is a, an element of, uh, uh, we pause for a while here, and then in, and we are looking at some guidelines in terms of uh, uh, not necessarily uh, technique per se. The next guideline is responding to the question, what is the level of care which is required for managing deep residual pockets with or without the presence of infrabony defects or fruitation involvement after completion one and two of the periodontal therapy? I think an important step, an important uh, guideline and recommendation here is that, yes, surgery has to be provided by dentists, but it's very clear that we have needs for further training. So there's a clear need, especially as we get to the more advanced surgical procedures, that further clinical training is required. It should be provided by those who have received the training or by specialists in referral centers. And I think in terms of health policy in different uh, European countries, what I think our societies and our governments have to do is to have efforts to improve access to this level of care for the patients that require to have it. In terms of uh, uh, what happens in cases that the expertise is not close by to primary care or referral is not possible simply because of geographical uh, terms, what can the practitioners do? What is the minimum level of primary care required for managing these residual pockets, which are associated with or without intrabony defects or fruitation defects, which, as we said in the beginning, increases the complexity of the case? In these cases, and I would like to stop say, using the word scaling and root instrumentation, uh, we should try to use the word uh, prophylactic mechanical plaque removal, PMPR, as often as possible. What the recommendation is, is that the minimum requirement in the context of high quality step and, and step two treatment is repeated PMPR of the areas with or without access flaps if there's a training or if there's abilities. And again, in these cases, the patients, uh, we need to create a frequent in individualized program for supportive periodontal care, which of course will, require, will include subgingival PMPR. And again, the grade of recommendations was very strong, was a grade A recommendation. And we move to one of the recommendations that, of course, uh, you know, when you're a periodontist, you don't necessarily need a consensus uh, to uh, state the obvious. But nevertheless, I think here, what we really know from the first minute that somebody starts studying periodontology or is involved in this area is about the importance of the self performer on hygiene within the context of not only this overall treatment, but specifically for surgical periodontal treatment. And we know from the literature, from the classic studies of the late 70s from Neiman, that actually high plaque scores are a contraindication for periodontal surgery, not only in terms that we have less uh, successful outcomes, but also from the fact that we have a relapse of the disease uh, in a shorter period. So the recommendation here is that we do not recommend performing periodontal, and here we also put, of course, the implant surgery in patients that do not achieve 
and are not able to maintain adequate levels of oral hygiene. And we move now to more advanced procedures. And here we will be discussing the regeneration. And of course, uh, guided tissue regeneration, the GTR, and the use of enamel matrix derivatives is a, a, an option, a treatment option that has been used for a number of years. And here is the question, is it still a therapeutic option for us? Now, if we look at this histological uh, slide here, this is the, from the first uh, membrane. You see, this is the membrane, this is the root. And you know, the researchers have been, the Newman, Karing, and Linda have been excited with this small amount of cementum that was present in the area. Of course, let alone the significant amount of inflammation because of the exposure of the gingival as well as under the membrane. But that was the first indication that if you create the space, you will get some uh, periodontal regeneration depending on the type of the defect. And this has been developed with preclinical models and clinical applications over a period of 30 years. And we know now that we can achieve quality of tissues, periodontal tissues, which are uh, equal to uh, pristine tissues. And of course, we have a very good long-term clinical results. And we have now indications from studies and also some that can be supported maybe from the systematic reviews that this may improve the overall tooth prognosis and potentially uh, we can discuss about tooth survival as well. Now, we talk about change of tooth prognosis and we need to put that we do regeneration in specific sites. We do not try to regenerate everything that uh, has a pocket in uh, within the mouth. Uh, we choose our sites, strategic positions, specific defects, and of course, the financial considerations that we may face according to the uh, uh, point of the tooth and what kind of restorations are around it is something that also has to come to the equation. And we'll discuss that also shortly. So in terms of guidelines on intervention management of intrabony defects, so the question that we would like to answer is what is the adequate management of residual deep pockets associated with intrabony defects? And I think here it's important to say that we look at pockets, uh, at uh, uh, defects that are equal or more than uh, three uh, millimeters. And once we have completed our treatment of our uh, step one and step two, there's a strong recommendation that residual pockets and residual deep pockets and intraponic defects of three millimeters or deeper, they will be treated with regenerative. They will be treated, sorry, with regenerative therapy. This is a supporting literature, a systematic review by Nibali, where we'll spend some time in uh, uh, discussing a little bit more the data uh, that uh, uh, they was produced in the systematic review. Now, if we look at the uh, question uh, that we have posed before, we can see that the mean benefit that was reported in terms of attachment level was 1.34 millimeters and 1.20 mill 1.2 millimeters in terms of pocket reduction. This is for all the regenerative procedures. And this corresponds an 80% improvement compared to control sites. So we have a significant positive impact in terms of resolving the uh, intrabony component and the periodontitis in the site. And of course, the authors indicate that the mean difference of this magnitude seems to be clinically relevant, and it is clinically relevant, of course, and it should be considered that it decreases the risk for tooth loss when, of course, these procedures are followed up with supported periodontal care, which will be discussed at the next webinar. The EFP consensus uh, and the guidelines and the BSP implementation of the guidelines address two specific points. One is the ethical considerations and the other is the economic considerations. Now, in terms of the economic considerations, there's not a lot of data out there. There's a study which is a follow up of 20 years of Cortellini, where in an element of a pilot study, he indicated that the initial cost increase, which is associated with periodontal regeneration due potentially to the use of biomaterials and, and other uh, uh, skill factors, they are actually in the long term associated with lower cost of managing the recurrence of the disease. The ethical considerations that were discussed uh, at, the, uh, at the document is that there's, based on the data, there's a perception that regenerative therapy results in better outcomes than access flow. And as such, in this specific cases in these specific defects, we need to choose a maximum tissue preservation flap, and we'll discuss that later on. And regeneration should be the standard of care. And this is important for us to consider 
uh, based in in the in, in the in the manuscript that uh, has been published by AFP and by the BSP. Now, how do we achieve this regeneration, and what are, what is available to us? And of course, uh, industry has provided with uh, a number of tools that we can use, from uh, non-resorbable and resorbable membranes to uh, bone replacement grafts to xenografts uh, to enamel matrix derivatives. So there's a lot out there which can be used alone or in combination to achieve the regenerative outcomes that we want in infrabony defects. And it's not that we waited for this systematic review to have all the answers. If you look in systematic reviews in terms of the use of biomaterials, we can see a systematic review for the absorbable collagen membranes, which indicated that the GTR with collagen membranes, with or without bone grafts, has significantly good clinical in, uh, outcomes. It is more favorable than open flap debridement uh, in terms of uh, attachment and pocket reduction, but of course they did not evaluate any tooth loss uh, if you know if they have managed to increase the survival of the teeth or not. In terms of uh, histology, we have the work that uh, that uh, I also participated with Professor Schoolen when we were back in Aarhus in Denmark. We can see that we have the human biopsies here that uh, the, the application of endogen will result in significant attachment, uh, significant uh, new cementum with uh, periodontal ligament and inserting fibers, and uh, which is the ultimate evidence that uh, periodontal regeneration takes place. So we have uh, uh, evidence to indicate that histologically, preclinically, and clinically, uh, we have uh, the different uh, GTR um, biomaterials and enamel matrix derivative work. And of course, there's even more systematic reviews which addressed uh, the fact and uh, the comparison between GTR and endogen, if there's any difference. And so far, the perception was that both GTR and endogen equally improve attachment level and pocket depth in infrabone and fruication uh, defects. And again, in a, state, in a position paper by school, and he was saying actually that the element of the gain of the attachment and the reduction that we achieve over long periods reduces the tooth loss. So if we look out there, the GTR the, and the different materials that are there, we have a, a plethora of materials as we discussed, but also we need to, in, to know when to use it, at what type of defects. We need to understand that these are technique sensitive uh, products sometimes, and uh, of course, uh, training, further training is needed. And the GTR uh, historically has been linked with a number of complications, especially the non resorbable barriers. Now, if we look at the combination therapies, as they call, for example, M to gain enamel matrix derivative with different bone grafts, they have uh, uh, already from 2008, we know from a systematic review from Trobelli that the additional use of a graft enhances the clinical outcome of enamel matrix derivatives. So let's see where we are with the systematic review uh, on this specific topic. So here I'm not going to discuss every single uh, combination, but I just want to demonstrate to you that the authors did a very good job in trying to create a, a granularity of the different combinations or techniques that have been compared with open flap debridement. The important point here is the open flap debridement versus all regenerative procedures is a very clear outcome. There's more attachment and gain, more pocket reduction and more bone gain when we have regeneration than open flap debridement in intrabony defects of three millimeters and more. Another point that may be interesting, but not necessarily uh, easily to interpret it biologically, is that by uh, taking the different biomaterials when they added to open flap debridement and, and enamel matrix derivative, only the demineralized bone and bone mineral seems to present significant attachment gain and pocket reduction. The synthetic biomaterial seems to produce more bone gain. Again, here some biological interpretation may be needed. In terms of uh, resorbable versus non-resorbable membranes, uh, I think it's very clear that when there's no exposure of the membrane, that there's no significant difference in terms of clinical outcomes. So, what is the recommendation about regenerative biomaterials for a clinical practice in order to promote healing of residual deep pockets in deep intrabony defects? So here we have, of course, in this type of defects, three millimeters or deeper with deep pockets, regenerative therapy is strongly recommended. It's a great A recommendation. And we recommend the use of either barrier membranes or enamel matrix derivatives with or without the addition of bone-derived grafts in, uh, these groups, uh, that, uh, in these groups of patients. So a very clear recommendation on that. 
Again, I think it's important to understand that the training that is required and the complications that may take place with the, the membranes and the membrane exposure, especially non-resorbable membranes, which are not necessarily used a lot nowadays, it's a, it's a difficult technique. And uh, uh, we have data from uh, a multi-center study from SANS that the results of the GTR group usually are heavily influenced by the frequency of the post-operative complications. And you can see that in most of the clinical uh, settings now, uh, more people use enamel matrix uh, derivatives. But of course, um, you know, the non-resorbable membranes are not something that we use uh, very commonly because also of the complications that they, they take place. And people, if they use GTR, they will probably use uh, non uh, they will use resorbable barriers. But of course, this is an element of preference and of training. Again, if we go now to compare specifically GTR with uh, uh, enamel matrix derivative, uh, we have an attachment gain of 1.27 millimeters. And I will actually represent you the percentage of improvement, which makes it more clinically relevant. So we have a 77% improvement for m gain and an 86% improvement for GTR. When we combine the GTR with bond-derived grafts, grafts, we have a 90% improvement in comparison to open flap debridement. But when you compare between enamel matrix derivative versus GTR, there was no statistical significant differences in terms of attachment uh, gain. And overall, there's, you can see that the differences are not that great. Now, it is important, as I said, the choice of biomaterial, first of all, you need the training required to do these procedures, but also the choice of my material, all the combinations will have to be based on the patient and on the site and the defect configuration more specifically. And this uh, is, of course, bringing me back to a number of uh, trials that have been performed over the years, but the defect uh, takes a significant, has a significant impact uh, of uh, how, uh, what type of materials we will be using. And of course, there's uh, studies on the radiographic defect angle. If it's more, um, more predictable to use, a narrow, to use a regenerative procedure in a narrow defect than a wider defect. And there's the study by Citura in 2004 and Tonetti that uh, has been uh, evaluating that. I think for the, uh, the purposes of this webinar, I think with the studies, the uh, very nice publications by Cortellini, which indicated when do we do what, according to which defect location and configuration we do which type of flaps uh, is, is, is very important. And for example, if there's the three, quarter, the three out of the four sides of the root are involved and we have a severe disease, then we're gonna do an extended flap. But if we only have a defect configuration, which is limited in the one side, for example, only uh, one side only or uh, in, a small, in a small area around the tooth, then potentially we'll be using a, a, mod, a minimal invasive procedure or a modified uh, MM mist, which will uh, minimize the amount of the, the uh, area that we will raise our flaps. And talking about flaps, it's an important point because this is the next guideline, the next recommendation. Uh, according to uh, the two studies uh, and two re clinical recommendations by Cortellini and Tonetti, the 95, there was the introduction of the modified papilla preservation flap, which uh, we will be uh, saving the whole papilla basically in that area, but also it will be a choice as a flap when the interproximal space is more than two millimeters. They modified this flap uh, in cases of interproximal space of less than two millimeters, and they created a simplified papilla preservation flap. And now these are the flaps that we're going to be considered as conservative flaps. And we today, uh, in, at least in, in many training centers, the simplified papilla preservation flap is probably even the flap that will be used for access uh, flaps designs as well. Again, this is important to know biologically why this is. And if we look at, if we take the simplified papilla preservation and compare it with a modified Whitman flap, what we did in a series of three studies uh, uh, almost 15 years ago, we have actually shown that uh, when you compare uh, um, uh, the different type of flap procedures and you follow the vascularization with laser Doppler flowmetry over the years, day one, day three, day seven, you can see how the healing is progressing in terms of vascularization. You can see that you probably get better results, and this is actually shown in the studies uh, with simplified pillar preservation flap for a simple reason. The 
response, the hyperemic response, this is the before surgery, this is after anesthesia, and this is at the end of the surgery. You can see you have a hyperemic response, which is similar to both uh, Simply Fiber Pill and, and Modify with my flap at day one. But you can see at day four, already the vascularization process has been completed with um, and you return to baseline uh, uh, with um, a simplified pillar preservation flap, whereas the process is more extended with a modified Whitman flap. And this faster vascularization may be a region that we have more uh, improved clinical outcomes with uh, uh, pres preservation flap procedures and specifically the simplified papilla. Since then, of course, different uh, surgical techniques have been uh, developed, and we have now the double flaps, and we have the single flaps like the MIST, and more recently, uh, the paper from Aslan in 2017 with the entire papilla preservation flap. Again, here we go to the Graziani paper, which clearly indicated that the conservative surgical procedures, the more conservative your procedure, the more the pocket reduction and the better the attachment gain. So I think there's a clear trend for uh, maintaining as much as we can both on soft and hard tissues. And this brings me to the next guideline, which is responding to the question, what is the adequate choice of surgical flap design for the regenerative treatment of residual deep pockets associated with an intrabony defect? Again, a very strong recommendation, grade A here. And the EFP and the BSP recommend that specific flap designs, such as papilla preservation flaps, are to be used to maximize the preservation of the interdental soft tissues when they're used with regenerative treatments. And under specific circumstances, which is again defined by the defect and the site, we can recommend limiting the flap elevation to optimize wound stability and reduce morbidity. Again, as I said, this is a strong statement, a, a, a strong recommendation. It's a great aid. And if you look at the paper of the uh, the EFP, we can as you can see that uh, all the discussions that we've had, the different uh, the different questions and the different choices. There's this nice uh, um, algorithm that indicates how to do what to do when and what is the level of uh, uh, the level of evidence that we have at the different points for. Uh, regenerative surgical procedures out of intrabony defects. And that brings me now to the last uh, uh, 10 minutes maybe for uh, uh, of the lecture, which is about furcations. And we all clinicians know and the dental team knows that furcation involved teeth are a clinical challenge. And we know from the literature from historic stu classic studies that presence of furcation defect is a clear risk for tooth loss. Sorry. Now, if we look at the classification of vacation defects very quickly, we have we have the class one, which is horizontal loss of periodontal support less than one third of the width of the tooth. We have the class two, which is horizontal loss of periodontal support more than one third of the width of the tooth. And of course, we have the classic uh, through and through expression, which indicates the class three furcation defects for both mandibular and maxillary molars. The subclass vertical component is important because it takes in the literature more uh, notice and more investigators evaluate it. We have the subclass A, which is vertical bone resorption of three millimeters or less when we measure it from the frication fornix. We have the subclass B, which is vertical bone resorption between four and six millimeters from the frication fornix. And we have the more severe one, the subclass C, where the vertical bone resorption is seven millimeters or more, and again measured from the frication fornix. And this is according to Tarno and Fletcher in 1984. Now, I think this is an important point to discuss about the furcation defects because we are seeing more and more implants placed and, you know, extracting a tooth is always very easy, but it's, uh, and, and the, the term force of threshold, which indicates what is the sensitivity, what is the level of the threshold for a dentist to decide when to extract the tooth or not, is something that we can discuss and has been evaluated uh, in the literature. And it has been shown that very often we extract Teeth uh, more than 60 with more than 60% of an attachment, and they justify that based on proactive strategic extraction, and then replace with procedures that they cannot have any access to oral hygiene. And we have evidence from Hong Kong that actually, if dentists are uh, are working in an environment where many implants are placed, then also that attitude or implant is changing and it's not always wholly in line with the evidence-based knowledge, and I quote directly from the paper. 
What that means and why is that relevant for our guidelines? Well, it's relevant for our guidelines because at the ITI consensus conference uh, some years ago, it has been shown that the most frequent indication uh, for implants is the molars. And basically, it's almost more than half of the implants placed is to replace, uh, for single implants, I'm sorry, is to replace molars. This is an important point because if we look at the projected figures of a study by Elan in 2018, indicates that by, well, that was of course before COVID, indicates that there's a reasonable projection that implant prevalence will be increased 23% by 2026. But an important point that I want to bring here is that the vast majority of the teeth that were extracted and placed by implants was the teeth 46 and 36, the first uh, the uh, the uh, lower left and lower right six, which indicates that maybe people extract these teeth faster and easier than uh, than they should. And if we look at a, a systematic review and a meta-analysis that we did with my team when I was still at the Eastman, we can say that if you really look at the literature, yes, there's a clear increased risk ratio for tooth loss for teeth that present furcation versus non-furcation teeth after 15 years. So yes, there's no doubt about it. This is supported by the evidence. And that, yes, indeed, the present of vocation will double the risk for molar loss after a prolonged period of time, even under SPT. However, what we have shown is that even in vocation degree two, three, sorry, through and through defects, they actually responded well to periodontal treatment. And it is a clear indication that a, an effort to maintain these teeth both degree two and degree three needs to be taking place. And this brings me swiftly to the next uh, guideline, which answers the question, what is the adequate management of molars with class two and class three furcation involvement in residual pockets? And here we have a combination of grade A and a statement. The grade A combination of recommendation says that we clearly recommend that molars with residual pockets and class two and three furcation involvement receive periodontal therapy. We need to try to save this teeth. And also a statement, which I think is very powerful, is that furcation involvement is not an indication for extraction. So we need to include it, these teeth in our treatments. Now, indicating regeneration, because this is the next topic of this type of defects, already in 2002, Jepsen has indicated in the first system, in the first systematic review that was done, that actually GTR is more effective than open flap debris when reducing both horizontal loss and vertical loss. So there's nothing new there. But from 2002 to 2019, many years has taken place, and let us see what actually the evidence, how the evidence looks like today. In terms of answering what is the adequate management of residual deep pockets associated with mandibular class two involvements, again, periodontal regenerative therapy is a clear recommendation. We recommend treating the mandibular molars with periodontal regenerative therapy. Again, a very strong rate of recommendation. Now, Now, if we look, I'm sorry, I don't know why this is happening. If we look now at uh, the different, uh, uh, we, go, uh, we go to the Jepsen uh, paper more in depth, and we can see the differences in terms of horizontal attachment gain. It was clear that all regenerative techniques in comparison to open flap debridement had a significant difference in favor of regeneration, approximately 1.6 millimeters. And if you look at the vertical component, again, all regenerative procedures, in comparison to open flap debridement, have presented significant improvement to the range of 1.2 millimeters for pocket depth reduction. It is important that we also move away, and this uh, this uh, meta analysis, network meta analysis, is important because it moves away from the perception that we need to always close the furcation defect, completely resolve. Actually, it's okay to move the furcation from a degree two to a degree one. The furcation improvement can be now defined as closure, which is optimal, of course, or co conversion to class one, which is very good and really easily maintainable with non-surgical procedures. In the systematic review, we have had uh, of the Epson furcation closure of zero to 60%, but also class conversion, which is maintainable. We had a, a wide range of 26 to 100%. Now, they have done a very thorough job, and I'm not going to go through every single combination procedure here. 
But you can see that we have significantly high numbers in terms of full improvement with all regenerative procedures, all of them. The only one that does not create any full improvement is the 6% is the open flap debridement. It overall makes an improvement in the area, of course, and reduces the pocket, but in comparison to regenerative procedures, seems not to be as effective. So we move now to the upper molars. And again, here we need to distinguish between the different um, uh, furcations. If we look at the maxillary buccal furcations, we have a clear recommendation from uh, evidence from the literature that we suggest we have a grade B recommendation here. We suggest, that's why we use the word suggest, periodontal regenerative surgery for buccal furcations in maxillary molars. If we want to look which are the appropriate biomaterials, then we recommend to treat these uh, residual pockets and buccal class II furcation involvements, either using enamel matrix derivative alone in combination with bone grafts or um, uh, uh, or with GTR, with or without bone grafts. Now, here there's again uh, the EFP um, uh, guidelines, which are uh, implemented by BSP, uh, raises two points. One is the ethical considerations we discussed before, and the other is the economic considerations. Starting from the ethical, we say that again there's a perception based on the literature that regenerative therapies do promote. Uh, better outcomes in infurcation defects and uh, uh, are preferred over tooth extraction clearly, but also open flap debridement. So in a sense, maybe in specific cases, we can consider them as standard of care. If we look at economic considerations, uh, there's a clinical benefits here, which are according to the uh, systematic reviews that justifies the cost. And if you look at the papers, indicate that the German, in the, within the German health system, the periodontal treatment of molars seems to be more cost effective than extraction and placement of implant and the maintenance of these implants and the complications that this may create. So something to uh, consider here and to think how we progress with these sites from now on. And again, this is uh, not new. It has also been, again, by far dull in another study in 2013, is indicated actually is uh, easier and cheaper to maintain neighboring teeth than, uh, than implants. And of course, uh, people, when they replace teeth with implants, do not necessarily factor the expenses or the significant amount of complications, biological complications that um, can come with implants as mucositis and perimplantitis. Now, moving on the maxillary interdental class two furcation, not the buccal one, uh, but we can we, we have here the evidence is, uh, is not that strong. So basically, we cannot support one treatment versus the other. And there's an open statement that non surgical instrumentation, open flap debridement, periodontal regeneration, root separation, or root section can be considered to treat maxillary interdental class two furcation involvement. So an open recommendations as the evidence is not clear cut for one technique over the other. What we accept though, and we have a position paper with a number of uh, colleagues on that, is that if we look at the evidence and we look at the guidelines, the predictability of regeneration is, uh, uh, in terms of regeneration, uh, not of treatment or resolution of the defect, is uh, a decreasing depending on the side. So the buccal furcations are clearly, as it's recommended also from the guidelines, those that we will go for regenerative uh, procedures. Uh, there's a predictability, but of course, uh, the, you can use, it's an open recommendation to try on the other, uh, the, 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 uh, the mesial and the distal maxillary um, uh, frication defects, but the predictability will, is not necessarily as high as that would be on the buccal uh, of a mandibular molar, for example. Again, the components, the other type of treatment procedures that we may have is how much do we trust uh, the teeth? And looking at uh, the different classic procedures where we do root resections and root amputations, and this is a case that uh, the slides, these actually were given to me by Professor Klaus Lang. Uh, you can see that uh, very often uh, in the in the 70s and the 80s, they would do this kind of large sort of constructive cross arch bridges where they will try to maintain a number of roots and with a combination of endodontic treatment and periodontal therapy will 
create restorative solutions which will be maintained for a number of years. So yes, we can trust the teeth and we have the surgical techniques to create uh, solutions. Now, in terms of what is the adequate management of maxillary class three fulcation involvements, again, there's an open recommendation. Uh, uh, there's evidence uh, for a number of procedures where we can do non-surgical instrumentation, open flap debridement, tunneling, root separation, or root resection can all be considered. Again, the predictability of one procedure versus the other, there's no clear, uh, uh, there's no something that we can strongly recommend one over the other. Again, at the same level of grade or recommendation on open recommendation for the management of mandibular class three fulcation involvements, very similar, non-surgical, open flap, tunneling, root separation, or root resection also for mandibular class three uh, involvement. And this is where uh, this uh, very nice algorithm on the paper of Jepson, you can actually see how all these things that we discussed, they can be uh, put in a very nice diagram of how to make the decision making according to the different uh, elements of uh, levels of evidence that we have and the strength of uh, the recommendation. Now, on the specific mandibular class three fulcation involvement, it's an important point to discuss on Domi's uh, uh, paper, is that the teeth have a wide survival range of four to 30 years. And um, uh, the survival for the root amputation or resection or root separation survive had from 38 to 94%, a wide range again. For tunneling was 62 to 67%, for open flap debridement 63 to 85%, but also for non-surgical therapy, we had a 68 to 80%. And that's why you start getting an idea why it's difficult to provide one recommendation over the other for this heavily, severely affected teeth. Again, the clinical recommendation, the clinical benefits justifies the cost of some of these uh, procedures. And again, the economic consideration discussed here was again, uh, in terms of the German health system, for example, indicates that the period treatment of molars is more cost effective than extraction and implant placement. So something for us to consider uh, when we look at these teeth and we implement the treatment and these guidelines in, in, in UK. In terms of, um, Oh, sorry. In terms of uh, economic uh, uh, economics of the periodontal care, there's a very nice study uh, on periodontal study by Thomas Fleming. If somebody would like to read it and, and understand how things are progressing, how we can justify different treatments based on finances and insurance companies, this is of course not uh, the uh, topic of this uh, discussion. In this presentation, but we have emphasized in back in 2018 that in periodontitis patients, in stage three patients, stage four patients, periodontal surgery, as long as we have, of course, very good oral hygiene, periodontal surgery followed by an individualized supportive periodontal therapy is, of course, effective in reducing periodontal pockets, but also for the patient, it may be more cost effective than extensive restorative solutions, which in some cases may also include dental implants. So, this is the component of the financial consideration that is very nicely covered of the EFP guidelines and the BSP guidelines. And then with this final thought, I would like to uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention. And uh, I will uh, apologize for the small technical problems during the presentation. And if there are any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. Hi Nikos, thank you for that. That was uh, a real tour de force of the of the step three. Uh, I know there's a lot of information in there that people need to try and draw out of that, but I think you covered certainly as much as you could in that time. And I'd encourage everyone to go back to the S3 now and start looking at the individual recommendations and even looking at the, some of the, the actual papers. Um, we've got lots and lots of questions, so I'll start putting them to you. Uh, we had one from um, Ken Easton, who asked, how will the, the, this guideline or how will the guidelines change your clinical practice? Um, I think, uh, I think it, it provides some clarity on uh, specifically, for example, for uh, interbony defects that, uh, uh, or fulcation defects that um, uh, we have now a lot of evidence to safely do periodontal regeneration with uh, long-term good clinical improvements. It gives us a clarification of when to do periodontal regeneration, for example. It also gives us an idea that uh, uh, 
the access flaps, the more conservative flaps, also for periodontal surgery, are equally good in pocket uh, reduction. There may have been an older perception that the more resective you are, the more uh, pocket reduction you achieve in the long run. But actually, you see that this treatment effect uh, is uh, only valid for the first uh, 12 months. It also indicates, uh, I will not even discuss the fact of the uh, plaque control because this is something that is really uh, within the periodontal community. We take that as granted that you wouldn't do anything else with oral hygiene. But the component of the subgingival reinstrumentation, re when that's possible, I think it should also be coming into mind that it's not always that we go in and we do directly surgery. We evaluate the site. And uh, when necessary and when possible, we uh, allow the subgingival reinstrumentation to take place as well. Again, the classification of pockets of equal or more than six millimeters, it makes it a robust now clarification that this is the area that we're going to do a surgery. And I think uh, there is, of course, a lot of discussion uh, about the equal or more than five millimeters, but at least it gives us a clear indication at which are the levels that we need to focus when we're going to do other. Uh, access flaps or regenerative procedures. Now, in terms of, unfortunately, in terms of the um, uh, multiple class fulcations or fulcation degree three, I still think the evidence is was not there to provide a robust guidance of which procedures we should be using for treating, for example, class three maxillary molars. Again, it's an open recommendation and it's on the decision of the practitioner and of course, uh, on the site management as well. Yeah, that's a, a great answer. And I think for, for many of us who know the literature, it, the S3 may not change things dramatically for us, but what it does is it has all of the evidence base in one place that allows people to, to I think, source their own information from a, from a, uh, a well-respected body of people and body of evidence. So I think it may not change certain periodontist practice, but hopefully it will significantly influence periodontal practice in the UK. I would certainly hope so. I agree with you, and and I think uh, you know by having these specific guidelines, we also streamline some of the procedures, which in a sense it, it probably takes away some doubts. Should I do that or should I do this? And I think uh, you know, of course, knowing the literature and with these guidelines, you you feel more confident that you're doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a question more about terminology here that I hope you can answer. Is access mm. flat the same as open flap debridement? And is a flap always replaced or do we still apically reposition? So open flap debridement is an access flap. Access flap is encompassing a number of flaps. So open flap debridement, modified Whitman flap are all access flaps. Uh, and uh, um, it is, of course, can create uh, some confusion. But access flap is the over the, the terminology that includes all the uh, all these type of flaps. What was the second part um, of the question? About is the flap always replaced, or do we is there still a place for apical repositioning? So if the apical reposition, I think the, the guidelines are very clear. If you want to do apical repositioning of the flap uh, in combination with the resective therapy, the guidelines are very clear that you're able to do it. You're going to have very good results in pockets more than six millimeters. Open flap debridement uh, usually indicates that you actually rep replace your flaps at the, at the pre-operative pre uh, level without trying to apically reposition them. So it is part of the conservative flaps where you actually try to maintain as much of the soft and the hard tissues and the minimize recession. The moment you start apically reposition any type of flap, the recession will be, will increase. Hmm. Um, just a very practical question here. and. I don't know how you do this, but it, do you have a simplified way of explaining fication involvements or infrabony defects to your patients? Uh, I have, a, I personally have some uh, drawings and uh, and try to uh, to give them the intrabony component. Tell them that they have a wedge in the bone that it, it accumulates plaque and it it's very difficult to clean and it keeps progressing. Uh, that is a very simplistic way. For the frication, I usually draw them and try to explain to use that the, that the two roots uh, maintain the crown as a big area and then the bone is missing in between them and as such. Uh, 
this is uh, needed in order to maintain the tooth in position in terms of overall structures. But I think that this is probably something that each person has a way of describing it in their um, in the practice in different ways. I don't know that it's a unique way of everybody explaining it. No, I think it whatever that's... works for anybody. Yeah, I, I certainly with fifications tend to use my fingers on one hand. So lower molars, yes. I'll show them two, thing, two fingers to aiming down. Uh, and then I, I talk about upper molars, like an upside down bar stool with, with different yes. ends. With three fingers, yes. Yeah, and that, that seems, and then once I've done that, I then take them to their x rays and, and then it tends to make more sense to them. Um, but yeah, I also it, try, yeah. I do the same, and for the upper, uh, for the maxillary molars, I use the three fingers. So basically, you try to explain to them the, th the different buccal component and the mesial component. But also, uh, I, I try to, you know, the through and, th you know, I try to simplify what through and through is and what degree two is. I, I usually do not necessarily include the degree one, the class one at that stage. You know, when we, uh, it's more the through and through the and degree, the class two. That would explain, but it's very similar to what you do. But it's a very simplistic way, and it depends. You know, it evolves with the discussion. Some patients understand it very easily. Some patients uh, uh, require more time, or even you know, uh, you know, drawings or X-rays, or trying to replicate the X-rays on a drawing. Yeah, 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 very much. Um, this is a this is a good question, and I think it's one that's not probably come out in the first two um, the first two webinars. But do these recommendations apply to stages one, two, and three cases, or can we apply this to stage four as well? Uh, it, it then says, obviously, there may be a less predictable response, uh, and the cases may not be as clear cut. So I don't know whether you want to explain about why this is yeah, stage yeah. one to three, and then stage four is coming later. Uh, the stage four is because it has the a restore, restorability component element here, how we restore the missing teeth. And of course, the patients have lost more teeth over the stage uh, during uh, when they're stage four. So, but of course, the missing teeth, uh, the existing teeth on a stage four patient that they have intrabony components, the same, uh, the same principles uh, would, uh, would apply. So if you have in a stage four patient application uh, uh, involvement, the same guidelines would apply. Or if you have an intrabony teeth, the same yeah that makes sense um i think it's probably just worth explaining that at the back end of this year there will be the s3 level uh, stage four guidelines so they'll be looking at specifically at stage four that paper will be out early in 2022 and that obviously the bsp will publicize that quite heavily and as nikos says there'll be lots of overlap you know, step one, step two, three, and four will all be relevant to these um, stage four perio cases, but there will be another emphasis on the rehabilitation. So that's the only sort of discriminating factor between what we're talking about now and what we'll be talking about this time next year. Um, a question here, it's sort of a bit of a political hot potato, I suppose. Perio referrals for, into a level three setting are often being sent back to be retreated in practice. Uh, even though they may be suitable for referral, what options do we have? Um, what are alternative options if the if the level three practitioners are being are bouncing the patients back? We appear to have lost Nikos for a minute. Bear with me a second. I don't know whether you can hear us, Nikos. No, we appear to have lost Nikos's sound. I don't. Maybe he's hit a button. Um, let me just go back to that question, and I'll see what I can do to answer that for you. Um, so the question relates to referrals into a level three setting being sent back, patients declining treatment due to uh, cost from a private specialist. I think I think at that point when you've offered the referral and when you have no other options, they can't afford private and, they, and there is no NHS uh, level three cover, 
I think at that point, you have to just do the best by the patients and provide ongoing non-surgical supportive care. But but everyone needs to be well and truly informed that um, ah. this is a compromised situation yeah. and the patient may end up progressing and losing teeth. So I think at that point, supportive care would be relevant, but with everybody fully engaged as to what um, what 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 stage of play things are at with that with regards to their disease. Sorry, Nick, I see you back in the room. Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you again now, yes. Ah. Were you just going to check the football score? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I have I have some problems with my headphones, so I don't know. If... Yeah, you are dipping in and out a little bit. Um... Can you hear us, Nikos? I can hear, yes. I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you then. I'll just okay. I'll go through a couple more questions if that's okay. Yes, um, please. Yes, uh, I removed my headphones so I should be able to hear you now. Okay, fingers crossed. I thought you'd gone to watch the football. Um, no, well, almost, almost there. <laughs> <laughs> so someone here is thanking you for the presentation. They they are asking. They noted from Nabali's study that in the uh, minimal flap, bovine bones seem to do well in three wall defects and that the results were better than the beta tricalcium phosphates. Um, do you use the beta tricalcium phosphates and what, what are your outcomes and experience? Um, well, we, the, I, I use the uh, BTCP, which uh, comes in combination with the enamelmatrix uh, delivered. Uh, I, I use it in clinical experience. Uh, is that it works uh, well. Uh, I have to admit that more and more in, uh, in the hospital and the clinical practice, we use the combination of generalized bovine bone mineral and endocrine based on the fact that uh, predictably in the clinics, we have good results, but also uh, in the literature. I cannot explain why, uh, would, I mean, it would, that the synthetic bone graph would have better bone gain than generalized bovine bone mineral, taking consideration that they are also um, uh, non resorbable up to a certain extent, uh, the BTCP, the fabric flavotype component, stays there. Uh, but uh, I think my experience, personal experience with both materials is, is uh, pretty good. And I cannot say that uh, from the review by anybody that you should be using one over, over the other. It seems that both provide uh, a good results. Yeah, thank you. Um... A question here that seems to span slightly step two and step three, but I think is related to the management of, of vertical bone defects, uh, probably Luigi's work that we'll both be familiar with. But what are the, were there any recommendations or what are the recommendations on the minimally invasive non-surgical approach versus the minimally invasive surgical approach? Well, again, here we have, um, we're running a, a large trial of uh, at uh, IQMUL, and it just started when Luigi was there, and then uh, uh, continued the study. There's there's no clear evidence, clear cut evidence saying that uh, you should be using uh, uh, one over the other. I think there is a lot of promise on the non-surgical minimum invasive procedure. I think we have uh, some positive uh, results, but I don't think we have clear cut evidence to say that you should prefer one over 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 the other. I would uh, like to see uh, our data for the coming, maybe in a couple of years from now, to mm. uh, make a, a clear judgment. But of course, the minimal, the non, the minimal invasive non-surgical therapy, in the way that is described in the literature and in the work that uh, we have done, is of course uh, uh, a very promising. Yeah, I think. I mean, I don't know whether I'm right on this, but my understanding, with regards to all the questions that have been asked in the S3 and the systematic reviews. There wouldn't really be enough evidence to look at the no. non-surgical minimally invasive approach because Luigi's only been looking at this for the last probably five or six years. And, and but it, it, it's certainly interesting that the non-surgical minimally invasive approach is certainly interesting, and he certainly seems to produce some very very nice results with that approach. And it's uh, everything it does, does more and more minimally invasive, which is which is exciting for all of us really. It does, and it, when it's done right, you have a lot of nice, a lot of um, uh, attachment game, but also resolution or radiographical uh, resolution as well. 
Uh, but I think it's still early days to say that, you know, uh, you will be using that instead of the minimally invasive procedure with the generation. I think we need to have more robust uh, data to, to come to step in the least. And as you correctly said, there is, uh, uh, there is no way uh, we can use uh, some of the existing systematic reviews from the guidelines that we recommend one over the other. Yeah. Um... Hello. Okay, so here's an interesting question. So, again, thanking you for the presentation. Um, it's talking about, so a lot of the studies look at the one year results in terms of pocket depth reduction and clinical attachment level gain. Is there some evidence that looks at longer term data, say five years, not just looking at surgical, but also non surgical approaches? And do we not see similar sort of maintenance over that time period? Yeah, and I, I only heard half of the question. Could you please repeat it before yes. my headset went off again? No problem. So basically, a lot of the papers that have been presented have looked at one-year data uh, mm -hmm. and look at a lot of those papers favour a surgical approach for greater pocket depth reduction. But uh, the, the question is really that some of the longer-term studies that have looked at both surgical and non-surgical over longer periods tend to show no clinical, no significant difference. Uh, do you have any comments on that? That was for the initially moderate deep uh, pockets on the attachment level component. I think the guidelines clearly favor that for sub for pockets more than six, equal more than six millimeters, uh, access flaps uh, are more effective than uh, uh, non-surgical therapy. So for the, the shallow pockets, of course, uh, uh, there is no indication for surgery, for immediately, for uh, initially moderate deep pockets, um, we have a very good result for the non-surgical, and it almost equal due to the access valve. But for the deep pockets, especially those associated with interbone, I think the guidelines are very clear that uh, uh, the first choice, if your hygiene is good, for the use of for surgery. I think I think we've got to remember. It does not mean that we cannot maintain a site. I think it's an, that's why I put what is the UK healthcare philosophy. If a site doesn't bleed and if it's monitored and you know it's just one site and it's it's maintained for a long period of time under monitor at the same level, that does not mean that we need to proceed immediately to surgery. We can maintain sites non-surgically for a number of years. But if the question is, is it better than surgery in resolving uh, the disease? The data show that the surgery. It is more and I think I think it's also worth just clarifying the, the the idea that we're not talking about a six millimeter pocket on a patient who walks into your practice needing surgery. Mm. The patient would have to go through step one, then they go through step two, non-surgical, and then we'd consider them for surgery in, in deep non-responding sites. So it's not this is not a six millimeter, seven millimeter pocket that walks in your door, goes straight to surgery. We, we would always have a step one and step two phase first. I absolutely agree. And that's why when I was doing the slides, I was emphasizing that we have this patient after completion of step, stage one, stage two, plus very good oral hygiene, whatever is residual pockets, then we proceed to that, that, that. I think this has to be very clear. I think there's nothing that we can uh, replace stage one, uh, step one, and step two. I, I think this has to be very clear. What we are doing, so we're trying to reduce the number of sites that we do surgery with very good uh, step one and step two. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I think we're so all the older that. days, like in me, that I was, you know, surgery was everything. You had to do as many surgeries as possible. I think that goes away. We try to have a very effective non-surgical periodontal therapy, call it to whatever you like. But this is the essence. The surgery will be happening once we have a site that we do not respond to stay to step one and step two. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, could yeah, okay, totally agree. Um just a question here. I, th I think you've probably sort of answered it because it, it was a sort of an open suggestion or recommendation, but for patients who can't manage their vacations, do you recommend and still do root resections? Um the uh I personally do that, yes, and if I can do a, a, a root resection instead of an implant and that is the case allows me, I would personally choose it. The guidelines and the recommendation says that you can do 
any type of treatment as long as it's uh, justified for the patient and you're able to uh, train to do so. So yes, if I have to do a root resection, as long as it's possible and the anatomical uh, configuration there allows me to do so, uh, yes, uh, it is a valid treatment. And it's, it's, it's one of the points that it's an open recommendation for the guidelines. And many people would have liked to have had more clear guidelines, more clear indications of when to do it and what is better than the other. But uh, as an open recommendation, the, it has to be interpreted yes, you should be able to do it as long as the anatomy allows you and you're trained to do so. Yeah, and it can be so predictable. It can be so such a great. It works very well. And, th yeah. and that's why I saw these two cases. You know, we uh, we still do them for maxillary molars and can have two good roots where you have good periodontal support. It works very yeah. well, and the patients can clean and they perform oral hygiene. It works very well, even in more extreme cases. We have the studies of Carnivale. We have the classic studies that indicated that these molars well, with good sections with amputation, you can maintain them under very good oral hygiene for many years and with complicated restorative solutions. Yeah, it can be a great solution for a sort of the classic. I mean, the last one I did, upper first molar, the distal buccal root removal. Exactly. When if you, when if you lost the tooth, it would be sinus augmentation and implants if they wanted a fixed solution. So, yeah, it it still very much has a place, very much. I absolutely agree, and I I really like to put the message here that actually we. That's why I said that in terms of insurances and projective and which single teeth are mostly replaced by implants is always the molars, the mandibular molars. Uh, I really think that vocation involvements are not a cause for extraction. It has to be a clear message. And I'm very happy that actually the guidelines provide this clear message because we should be able to treat them and maintain them and do all the other treatments, resections, or amputations as necessary to maintain the teeth. In periodontitis patients with increased number of biological complications and percentages that they present, really, there's no justifications if we can maintain some of these teeth to extract them. Yeah. Um, we've got a question here that it's similar to the question that was asked when you dipped out of when your sound went off. But so I'll, I'll ask this question, although it's similar. Um, I think it's worth it worth having a conversation. So due to the massive delay for patients attempting to access NHS periosurgical managed uh, treatments, which is almost non-existent in certain areas, um, the patients usually end up stuck in in general practice so the question is 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 periodontal treatments exclusive or surgical periodontal treatments exclusively for private patients or how do we go about increasing access <laughs> well the uh, i the think that, uh, in the room, isn't it, Nichols? <laughs> we, how long time do we have um <laughs> I think here it's uh, first of all uh, I, I I feel for our colleague because it, it reflects a reality uh, in our country that in some areas there's no access for this uh, for these patients and for our profession, our, our GDPs to refer further, which indicates a, a severe health and society problem. I think um, I think the guidelines are very clear and the. Uh, and, and what we have in the UK in terms of uh, the between the practices of the BSP is that uh, um, we indicate and the guidelines indicate that you need to maintain this teeth as much as possible in a non-surgical way and create a, a supportive preventive care for these patients to maintain this teeth. This is valid and I think this is also the value of these guidelines which allow, uh, indicate to the practitioner that this is a valid option where there's no other alternative. I don't think that uh, periodontal care and periodontal surgery is exclusively for private patients, uh, uh, as long as it's secondary care or a class tier two practitioner in, in, in the area, then they should be able uh, to offer these services up to a certain extent. But the truth of the matter is that in some areas there's no access and the patients have to travel very far. And this is a, 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 a discussion and, and, um, and a question that I'm not sure I can provide valid answer in terms of actually yeah. doing giving a, a something substantial um we know that there are areas of the uk that they, they they suffer from lack of access and they almost goes to the general practitioners who need to be up, keep updated and do their best to maintain the teeth in a non-surgical manner 
Um, I think there are systems in place and the BSP is promoting these uh, systems in place. And I know Ian, you work well, which is as well, that within the primary care setting, we try to maintain under NHS conditions, uh, 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 teeth and periodontitis patients and periodontal involved teeth uh, as long as possible. And we try to create uh, there's a, an effort to maintain them within systems. But it is the truth of the matter is that in certain areas of the UK, uh, that would be a problem. But at least the guidelines indicate that you should be able to perform a surgical and try to maintain this teeth and try to individualize as much as we can uh, the patients according to the needs and the severity of the disease. Yeah, I think the, the other thing I would add to that is that there are definitely, or the, the, certainly pre-COVID, there were moves afoot from, from the NHS quarters of the tiering system for, for you know, uh, tier two practitioners and potentially in some of the commissioning guidelines that a tier two practitioner will be able to do some simple surgery whether we see full funding of that service whether we see regenerative periodontal treatment funded because it can be quite an expensive treatment because of the biomaterials uh, that's all very much up in the air but you know potentially access may increase with the tier system um because i yeah, think that Yes, I would agree, and that's what I said. If there's not tier two or, or, or a hospital around, it's a problem. Uh, again, though, if we look at the tier system the, until it, it starts being uh, um, all over, you know, have a coverage, wide coverage for the whole country, I think it will take uh, some time. That will for sure be a solution in terms of periodontal surgeries, uh, as far as I know from the qualifications that, uh, as you know, we have in our website in the BSP, the qualification for tier two, the generic qualifications, um, uh, they should be able to provide the periodontal surgery. Now, how many of uh, uh, these uh, uh, dentists with special interest or uh, specialists in tier two level will be present in different areas? I think, again, it's, it's a practical question. So I, I have a feeling that it will be more around bigger centers and less in, in areas where maybe there's a greater need as well. Yeah, I would I'd probably agree. Um, we're coming to the end. There's a, there's a question here, not really an evidence-based question, but one that just really, uh, it's a very valid question. In your experience, do you find that there is uh, an increase in root fracture with root resections, especially when uh, you root resect in mandibular molars? Um, you know, we try to avoid the fracture uh, um, depending on which root you maintain. So you try to maintain uh, usually the distal root rather than the medial from anatomical and uh, aspects as well. Uh, my personal experience uh, is based also what is in the literature that the fracture of these teeth is a, is, is, is a risk and it can it can take place and really depends again from the anatomy. So uh, my experience does not add more value to what the literature tells us that after a period of years, uh, these teeth will suffer either from root tarries, tarries or fracture. Oh, the sound's gone. I think the other the other thing that I'll always consider will be the occlusal scheme, the occlusal load, the restorative load on the tooth. Um, I, if I feel that the tooth is particularly vulnerable, we'll think about hemisections and basically turn a molar into a premolar if we don't feel that the, the, we want you know, if we want to reduce the occlusal table. Um, but it yes, is of course. It, of course, this is a valid point. But uh, I, you know, I, I thought that you know depends if it's a mandibular. I, I think the most important is to choose the right route and to ensure that you, the route that you maintain has the value for your dental support. Then after yeah. that, the crucial plane, the crucial surface will be modified anyway because you have a smaller area. And uh, again, uh, it it is it is a likely it will. It is, the evidence shows that there would be an increased uh, fracture rate. Just dipped out a little bit there, Nikos. Um, I'm conscious that it's 8:30, um, and nothing to do with the football being on at all. But I was, we, we decided that the, the tonight's Q&A would finish at, at 8:30. Obviously, with Nikos' sound just dipping out there, I think now is a good time to call call things to a close. I'd like to thank you all for listening. I would encourage you all to register and tune in in two weeks' time when we have the last webinar in the series uh, on 
supportive care from Professor Nicola West. And that just leaves me to thank you all for listening and also thank you to uh, my good friend, Professor Nikos Donos, for what's been a superb evening. Thank you very much, Nikos. Thank you very much and thank you for the attention and thank you for being a great host as always. So uh, hopefully we'll have a very good continuation of the evening, the two of us. <laughs> That's the only well, thing that's left for us to celebrate. <laughs> good night, everybody. Take care. Take care.